Chapter 1. There are several ways to treat psychological conditions. Cognitive therapy is one of them. Cognitive therapy was founded by a group of psychiatrists and psychologists at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Aaron T. Beck, who started refining his unique approach to mood change in the mid-1950s, is credited with the systematic implementation and empirical assessment of this approach in treating clinical depression. Cognitive therapy's simple, efficient mood control strategies include rapid symptomatic improvement, understanding, self-control, prevention, and personal growth. In the sense that it has been tested and validated at the highest academic levels, cognitive therapy is exceptional. It is, however, realistic and founded on common sense, and you can put it to use. The first principle of cognitive therapy is that your cognitions or emotions are responsible for all of your moods. The way you see things, your thoughts, mental behaviors, and values is referred to as cognition. The second principle is that when you're down, a constant negativity dominates your thinking. According to the third theory, twisted thought, which involves gross distortions of truth, is a major cause of your misery. As a result, mastering techniques that help you pinpoint and remove the mental distortions that cause you to feel agitated will help you learn to cope with your moods more effectively. You will feel better when you begin to think more critically. Research done at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine showed that more patients responded to cognitive therapy. This finding does not imply that you will never be sad again if you use cognitive therapy to treat your current blue moods, although it is possible to feel better on the spur of the moment. Feeling better requires a systematic application and reapplication of the techniques that will raise the mood when the occasion occurs. Chapter 2. Diagnosis is the number one step in the cure of depression. The Beck Depression Inventory, BDI, is a veritable mood measuring device that detects the presence of depression and accurately rates its severity. There are 21 questions in the BDI that have been developed to help you detect your level of depression. Your total score can be as low as 0 and as high as 63. The classification of the scores are as follows. 1 through 10, normal range. 11 through 16, mild mood disturbance. 17 through 20, borderline clinical depression. 21 through 30, moderate depression. 31 through 40, severe depression. Over 40, extreme depression. Despite the simplicity of this questionnaire, it is a highly sophisticated tool for diagnosing depression, as many research studies have shown. To be able to assess your progress effectively, you need to take the BDI test at regular intervals. The methods and principles outlined in this book are safe for all depressed individuals to try to treat themselves. The key to feeling better quickly is the decision to try to help yourself. You can convert the energy spent on depression into vital and creative living that lets you enjoy your life and work. You should seek professional help if you consistently score a minimum of 17 for at least two consecutive weeks on the BDI scale. If you score two or three in questions 9 and 20, which ask about suicidal thoughts and physical pain respectively, you display symptoms that indicate the existence of a mental disturbance that may need psychiatric treatment. You are having manic episodes. If your score is under 17 and you do not have a strong suicidal urge, hallucinations, or symptoms of mania, you can help yourself get better by using the methods outlined in this summary. Chapter 3. Negative thoughts that fill your mind are the actual cause of your self-defeating emotions. Every time you're depressed about something, try to recall a negative thought that preceded and accompanied the depression. You can change your mood by learning to restructure these thoughts, which are what caused your bad mood in the first place. Automatic thoughts are negative thoughts that have become a part of your life. Your feelings are completely determined by how you see the situation. It is an apparent neurological reality that you must process and assign meaning to every occurrence before you can feel it. Before you can sense what is happening to you, you must first understand what is going on. There are 10 cognitive distortions that underpin all of the depression symptoms. These distortions are similar to a radio signal that isn't tuned to the correct frequency. The distortions are all or nothing thinking, overgeneralization, mental filter, disqualifying the positive, jumping to conclusions, magnification and minimization. Emotional reasoning, should statements, labeling and mislabeling, personalization. By taking a simple self-assessment quiz, you can strengthen your understanding of the 10 distortions. Feelings aren't the same as reality. They are merely a reflection of your thoughts. Your thoughts and behaviors will reinforce each other in a self-perpetuating vicious loop until you invite depression into an automatic sequence of cognitive distortions. It's hard for the feelings evoked by your thoughts to decide whether or not those thoughts are true. Since mental distortions are neither true nor beneficial, the trick is to prevent painful feelings based on them. Modifications to illogical thought habits can have a significant impact on your moods and your ability to live productively. Chapter 4. People living with depression see themselves as deficient in the qualities they value most highly. A negative self-image acts as a magnifying glass, magnifying a minor flaw into an overwhelming symbol of personal defeat. Unfortunately, you may not be alone in your feelings of inadequacy when you are depressed. In certain instances, your maladaptive belief that you are flawed and no good can be so convincing and enduring that you can persuade your family, friends, and even your psychiatrist to support this view of yourself. You need to understand that your worth is not tied to what you do. Achievements can't increase your self-worth, but it can make you happy. 
Pseudo-esteem is described as self-worth based on accomplishments. How you feel is solely determined by your own sense of self-worth. One of the defining characteristics of cognitive therapy is that it stubbornly refuses to accept a person's sense of insignificance. Building self-esteem can be done in a variety of ways. The first approach is to converse with your inner critic. Your internal self-critical discourse creates a feeling of worthlessness. Train yourself to identify and write down self-critical thoughts when they arise. Understand why they are skewed and practice talking back to them so that you can create a more rational self-evaluation. We are experiencing a crucial development in modern psychiatry and psychology. A promising new approach to understanding human emotions based on a cogent, testable therapy. Dr. David Burns. Mental biofeedback is the second technique. It entails using a wrist counter to keep track of your negative thoughts. When a negative thought about yourself crosses your mind, press the button. Be on the lookout for such thoughts. Make a note of your regular cumulative score in a logbook at the end of the day. You will notice the changes as they occur and be better able to develop a solid level of self-control. So when you are upset, remember to focus on those automatic negative thoughts and write them down. Go through the list of 10 cognitive distortions. Replace a more objective thought for the one which made you feel worthless. Chapter 5. You can substantially change the way you feel by changing the way you act. The way depression paralyzes your willpower is one of the most damaging aspects of depression. You can simply procrastinate about doing a few dreaded chores in its most basic form. As your lack of motivation worsens, nearly any task seems to be too daunting and you feel compelled to do nothing. To find the real cause of motivation paralysis, we have to look to cognitive therapy. The mindsets that are most commonly associated with procrastination include hopelessness, helplessness, overwhelming yourself, jumping to conclusions, self-labeling, undervaluing the rewards, perfectionism, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of disapproval or criticism, coercion and resentment, low frustration tolerance, guilt and self-blame. The following self-activation techniques might help you deal with your brand of procrastination. The daily activity schedule. It consists of two columns, namely the perspective column and the retrospective column. The former contains an hour-by-hour -hour plan for what you would like to accomplish each day, while the latter contains what you actually did during the day. It may be the same or different from what you planned. Each activity should be labeled with the letter M, which represents mastery and P for pleasure. Then include the degree of difficulty for each task using a rating between 0 and 5. If you adhere to the schedule, you will find your motivation increasing. Anti-procrastination sheet. You will practice testing negative predictions with this sheet. Per day, write down one or more activities you've been putting off in the appropriate column. If a task takes a significant amount of time and effort, it is best to break it down into a series of small steps, each of which should take no more than 15 minutes to complete. Now, using a 0 to 100% scale, rate how difficult you think each step of the task will be in the next column. If you think the job will be easy, write down a low estimate of 10 to 20%. For more difficult tasks, use 80 to 90%. In the following column, use the percentage system to predict how enjoyable and rewarding it would be to complete each step of the mission. Complete the first phase of the challenge after you've registered these predictions. Take note of how challenging each move turned out to be as well as how much gratification you got from doing it after you've accomplished it. Daily Record of Dysfunctional Thoughts When you're feeling frustrated by the need to do nothing, this record will come in handy. Simply jot down the thoughts that come to mind when you're thinking about a specific mission. This will instantly reveal the nature of your issue. Then, write down logical answers that demonstrate that these feelings are irrational. This will assist you in gathering the necessary energy to take the first difficult move. You'll build momentum and be on your way once you've done that. You probably aren't aware of this if you are a procrastinator. So, you're lying in bed, waiting for an idea to come to you. I don't feel like it, you complain when someone suggests you do something. After all, who said you had to feel that way? You could wait an eternity if you wait until you're in the mood. Chapter 6. Your irritability quotient refers to the amount of anger and annoyance you tend to absorb and harbor in your daily life. The irritability quotient is measured by a list of 25 potential upsetting situations, which are estimated using a simple rationing scale from 0 to 4. 0 being the mildest of irritability or annoyance, and ascends to 4 which is the most intense. This scale was created by Dr. Raymond W. Navico of the Program of Social Ecology at the University of California, Irvine. The full scale contains 80 items. Be focused on the things you want. Instead of telling people off, compliment them on what they did right. Disarm them and clarify your point of view again calmly and firmly. Negotiating principles can work effectively in angry situations. There are 10 things that should be known about anger. The events of this world do not make you angry. Your thoughts create anger. Anger does not help. It immobilizes you in your hostility to no productive end. The majority of the time, the emotions that cause indignation include distortions. Your rage stems from your assumption that someone is behaving unjustly or that some incident is unjust. When you grow to see the world from the eyes of others, you'll also be shocked to discover that their acts are not inherently unjust. Some people generally do not believe they are deserving of your wrath. As a result, you're unlikely to produce any positive outcomes from your experiences with them if you retaliate. When people judge you, disagree with you, or don't act the way you want them to, a large part of your frustration is a shield against self-esteem loss. 
Such rage is never necessary because you can only lose your self-esteem as a result of your own negative skewed thoughts. Unmet goals lead to frustration. It was realistic because the incident that disappointed you was a part of reality. To insist that you have the right to be upset is immature pouting. It's rare that you need your rage to function as a human being. It is not true that you will become an emotionless robot if you do not have it. Did you know, mania is a special type of mood disorder and the opposite of depression. Chapter 7. The Cognitive Theory Provides a Kind of Emotional Calculus That Makes Many Questions Much Easier to Resolve Guilt is the feeling you'll get if you have these thoughts. Since my acts fall short of my moral values and contradict my sense of justice, I have done something I should not have done. This disruptive conduct demonstrates that I have an evil streak or a tainted character or a rotten core, etc. Guilt is based on the idea of one's own badness. In the absence of it, your negative acts can elicit a healthy sense of remorse but not guilt. Remorse is the undistorted recognition that you have behaved in a hurtful and unnecessary way against yourself or another person, in violation of your personal ethical principles. Healthy feelings of remorse can lead to a change in behavior. You can now decide if your feelings are a natural and balanced sense of remorse or a self-defeating, distorted sense of guilt using these criteria. Did I intentionally do something bad, unfair, or needlessly hurtful that I should not have? Am I branding myself a bad or tainted person because of this action? Am I experiencing regret or remorse, which results from a genuine awareness of the negative results of my action? Am I learning from my mistakes and developing a strategy for change? Or am I just doing things that are not productive? Some methods that will allow getting rid of inappropriate guilty feelings and maximize your self-respect are Daily record of dysfunctional thoughts Should removal techniques Ask yourself, who says I should? Where is it written that I should? Learn to stick to your guns Anti-whiner technique Simply finding a way to agree with the winner Mori Moner method Finding a way to agree with what a person is saying, and then distracting the moaner by commenting on something positive in the complaint. Developing Perspective Chapter 8. Sadness is a normal emotion to a negative event. Reactive depression occurs after an obvious stressor, sickness, death, or failure has taken its course. It has no benefits at all and is one of the worst forms of suffering. The only great thing about this kind of depression is that a person grows when they recover from it. Your emotions are created mainly by your thoughts and perceptions about a negative event. These emotions are the result of whatever meaning you attach to an event. When you eliminate the many distortions that accompany a negative issue, you will find that coping with the real problem will become less painful. Whenever a negative situation occurs, it is healthier to let go. You might get a feeling of closure and a sense of goodbye. This can be less frightening. It can be calm, peaceful, and more positive for you. The end goal of every human is to get better after any negative episode. But there is a world of difference between feeling better and getting better. When you feel better, it means you no longer feel the painful symptoms at the moment but getting better is different. It implies that you understand the reason for your depression, you know why and how you got better, are acquiring self-confidence and self-esteem, and can identify the deeper causes of your depression. Your silent assumptions are the ramifications with which you define your self-worth. Rejection is never your fault. One of the greatest pains a person can try to inflict on you is through rejection. The key to emotional enlightenment is the knowledge that only your thoughts can affect your mood. Dependency means that you are unable to assume responsibility for your emotional life. The truth is that being lonely is undeniably emotionally inferior to being alone. The first step in changing any personal value is to determine if it works more to your advantage or disadvantage. Acknowledge that human worth is just an abstraction. It doesn't exist. The second is to realize that worthy and worthless are just empty concepts when applied to a human being. The third path to self-esteem is to recognize that there is only one way you can lose a sense of self-worth, by persecuting yourself with unreasonable, illogical negative thoughts. The fourth path to self-esteem is your decision to treat yourself like a beloved friend. The harder you work toward perfection, the harder your disappointment will become because it isn't real. Chapter 9. The ultimate victory is the victory of living, choosing to live life at its fullest. If you are suicidal, it is of great importance for you to evaluate these impulses in a matter-of-fact manner. Using your common sense, the following factors put you in a high-risk group. If you are severely depressed and feel hopeless. If you have a past history of suicide attempts. If you have made concrete plans and preparations for suicide. If no deterrents are holding you back. If one or more of these factors apply to you, then it is vital to get professional intervention and treatment immediately. The conviction of hopelessness is one of the most curious aspects of a depressive illness. In fact, the degree of hopelessness experienced by seriously depressed patients who have an excellent prognosis is usually greater than in terminal malignancy patients with a poor prognosis. It is of great importance to expose the illogic that lurks behind your hopelessness as soon as possible in order to prevent an actual suicide attempt. The modern era of research on the chemistry of mood disorders began several decades ago, when it was hypothesized that depression might result from decreased levels of certain brain substances, known technically as amines. They are chemical transmitters which nerves use to send messages to each other. Amines are the brain's biochemical mailmen, 
particularly concentrated in the limbic system, a primitive brain region which appears to be involved in mood regulation. Certain negative attitudes and irrational thoughts can interfere with proper drug treatment. However, we have also found that in some cases, an antidepressant appears to provide some needed leverage that can facilitate your efforts to help yourself. Conclusion Cognitive therapy provides a trusted means of dealing with blue moods. Considering the fact that it helps to avoid the side effects of drug therapy and it actually helps depressed people to get better, it is a preferred method to conventional psychotherapy. You will not always be happy. Nobody is always happy. But you can manage your emotions so that they are always positive. When you find yourself slipping down a black hole and it seems like there is no coming back, take some time off to talk to your trusted friends or a mental health professional. If you are not sure about whether or not you are depressed, talk to a mental health professional as soon as possible. They will carry out an examination and diagnosis. The first step to getting better is getting the right diagnosis. This is just so you do not focus on the wrong things. Aim for success, not perfection. Dr. David Burns Cognitive therapy has taken giant strides in the world of psychiatry and many other fields. As new ideas and innovations come, it is hoped that humans will be the better for it and the world will be a more positive place to be. Try this. Answer the questions on the Back Depression Inventory, BDI. Also, make a list of how you reacted in the face of a negative event. Think back to how you might have reacted differently. Also, see a mental health professional if you do not understand how you feel.